Good evening. I'm Anne McLean from the Library's Music Division. I'm so delighted tonight to be talking with Seth Parker Woods, a remarkable cellist, as you'll hear, and truly a visionary artist. Welcome. Thank you for having me. How are you all doing? <laughs> all right. Yeah. It's been so exciting for us to hear you rehearse today this very rich program, one that centers on identity and narrative storytelling and a stunning group of multi-voice compositions conceived and played for by a single voice. Um, and so we want to talk about this remarkable program, which many of the pieces were written for you. You, can, you can commissioned them. Except for Bach. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I knew him. No. <laughs> So yeah, great. Three three centuries, and you said you lo liked the the idea of framing the pieces with the sarbans because they were human and contemplative. Why these three in particular? Well, I've lived with all of these suites for well for a long time now, um, and it's always been in not only in, in the first, second, and the fifth, which you'll hear this evening, um, but all of them. But I've always found that, especially in the first suite with the G major suite, which has always been so close to my heart, it, it has a sense of, um, at least for me, as I'm, as I'm playing it in the years I've spent studying this work, it has a way of kind of lifting one out, almost like an out-of-body experience. Still quite contemplative um, and subjective, I think, for the listener. Um, I found that if I could take a few of these, and this kind of this this program, thus spoke their verse, is kind of comes out of a, a larger project that I started creating 15 years ago when I was living in Europe, and at that time it was um, a, pro a project that I was doing in multiple museums and art galleries called the Lion's Den, where I had this long kind of bench that we would put through kind of the main foyer and would allow audience members to sit alongside me or back to back with me as a different experience of experiencing concerts and also being that close to the performer. I'm still waiting. I think hopefully I'm going to do that here in the States at some point. But, um, but inside of that, I was kind of framing also multiple movements from the box suites along with um, these other contemporary works that were in conversation with them. Um, so these three sarabans uh, for me are um, the most personal, I, sh I should say, of all of them for myself. And so I found I could use these as kind of departure points or conversation starters with other works that, for this whole program, it's spanning three centuries, um, with some works that were written as, as late as just a few years ago. Um, so it's I'm quite excited to kind of be jumping back and forth, but also for this specific concert, getting to play on the Castelbaco uh, Stradivarius also, and alongside of this beautiful Granchino, which is about eight years um, I guess younger than the, than the Stradivarius. So they're not that far in, in time, but also in location either, yeah. That's, I hadn't thought of that. You're absolutely right. Our cello is, is from that period, exact period. Well, you know, I'm speaking about this project, which has grown and morphed and changed over the last few years, it grew out of a truly uh, tour de force multimedia project, but it's continuing to grow and evolve, and you made a, a fantastic recording. Now tell us a little bit about this evolution, and I believe you have a Grammy nomination in progress for this recording. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, that is correct. Uh, <laughs> I'll find out in just a few days. In, in two days, I, th three days, I'll find out <laughs> the verdict. <laughs> Center good juju. Uh, <laughs> uh, but that project is Difficult Grace, which uh, in many ways started uh, during my time when I was artist in residence with the Seattle Symphony from 2018 th to 2020. Um, in that time, task one with helping them build a new concert hall, but for that concert hall was also to commission a series of new works, either for solo cello, cello and electronics, or uh, with multimedia. So I scoured and looked and asked friends and friends of friends of friends to kind of pull together a series of creatives that I could start to work with that could create for this hall and beyond. Um, and so some of those pieces that exist inside of Difficult Grace you'll hear this evening, one of them being um, Difficult Grace, which comes, uh, it, it's a piece um, created, co-created by myself and composer Frederick Gifford, who is based in Chicago. 
Um, and the text which you'll hear me speak or orate um, comes from a poem by the late poet Dudley Randall. How many of you are familiar with Dudley Randall? Okay, some of you. Um, he started the Broadside Press in the, um, the early 60s, 70s, um, and one of the big outputs from that period is called the Black Anthology of, uh, the Anthology of Black Poets. Um, so inside of there, there's a piece of his called titled Primitives from 1962, which is part of a larger collection um, of his titled uh, Cities Burning. Um, and so this kind of becomes the jumping off point. Um, so in, in, in this work, you'll hear me both uh, narrating um, live, but also there's six other voices of myself and my cello also layered inside of this that you'll hear. So it becomes this, um, this enmeshment of sound and texture all together. Um, and then a few of the other works that are on this program as well. Um, Winter Tendrils by Monty Atkins. He's a British composer uh, that I met during my doctorate um, in the UK. Um, I think I met him in 2013, I think it was, something like that. Um, and so we started working and kind of bonding over this idea of um, long distance running, long distance cycling, and this kind of runner's euphoria, cy cyclist euphoria that you get along the way, the kind of the pushing up against a struggle, mental struggle and physical struggle, but at the end, there's a crest that essentially happens or an opening. So that essentially becomes the, the frame which, which we explore this work um, for solo cello and uh, fixed electronics. But on top of that, because we cannot fit in here, there's a giant kind of IMAX screen that uh, presents this beautiful film by the British um, film artist, um, Zoe McLean. Uh, so you just have to imagine this beautiful thing behind me. Um, and then the last piece that's kind of adjacent, at one point was really a part of Difficult Grace in its early onsets, is Dam Wenyo, um, which is, means um, these are my ladies in Haitian Creole by the, um, well, she has so many titles, um, both flautist, singer, and composer, who I think was also here at one she point. Was here with Flutronics, yeah, with Flutronics her dual amazing. partner, Alison Loggins Hall. Um, so, this is very much so an ode and tribute to the women in her life that raised her, that taught her how to be a woman, how to exist in this world. So, very much so, it's an ode to sisterhood. And so the cello essentially be, uh, serves as a secondary voice singing their songs. Yeah. So you'll hear field recordings of her nephews playing on their farm, their family farm in, um, in uh, oh my god, what is it? <laughs> um, it's just outside of uh, Port-au-Prince, yeah. yeah. So this program, it really has so many voices, the ones that you've commissioned and put together, but also uh, voices from Cambodia, the Asian world, the Chinnery Ung piece, which was such a poignant circumstance, the way that it was out of a nine-year period of silence for him as a composer, but also Alvin Singleton's piece, Our Guru, um, which has a title from a Ghanaian language, I believe. So how did you put these together, These all these just put voices? How did you choose them and put them into sets? Um, <laughs> experimenting. <laughs> so I took them all and I kind of started to, I took one of the, the set of bonds. I was like, okay, let me just start to just play through some of this and see, is there a link in a narrative? In the same way that I went about putting together Difficult Grace in many, many of my programs, how do they, how do I create conversation? Not necessarily, oh, well, this one's in D major and then, and then that one's in A minor. You know, not necessarily that is based on harmonic structure, but more so the actual narrative behind them. What feels lighter, what feels darker, what's more contemplative, if there are actual, um, geographic or historical connections to many of these pieces, I start to work in that way, similar to like creating archives, essentially, curating archives. Um, but I'm just doing it with sound. Um, and so with the Jinri Ong, it's probably the, uh, alongside of the box suites, it is the oldest work that I've been playing. Um, I've discovered, I met Jinri and discovered this piece 20 years ago. So it's been living with me and in me and my body. <laughs> for 20 years, and it's been amazing to, to watch myself change and uh, my understanding of the music and the narrative and also what he went through to be able to even write this piece. This serves as the very first truly Western work of his in, in many ways, uh, and he dedicated this piece and wrote it for the late um, Mark Johnson of the, the now defunct uh, Vermeer Quartet, if you're familiar with them. 
Um, so this is an amazing work that I, one, got to know Mark, but also got to know Chinnery to kind of live, truly live in this world and allow it to evolve with time. Yeah. You know, you use that phrase in the, in the body, and that's something we talked about very briefly earlier, that um, it, it's a concept that interests me, and if you could art, uh, elaborate a little bit on that. You said we have stories in our bodies and we need to tell them. Yeah, there's a phrase, what the body remembers, and if we look at, um, there's, a, I don't want to, Go full child professor here on you. Uh, so <laughs> um, but it, it, in, in essence, um, looking at the ways and with the things that we've gone through, the things that we remember, and what truly gets stored beyond our own psyche. Um, so trying to harness um, movement or gesture um, or trying to re release things that have happened to us in time that may either deal with happiness and joy or even trauma. And we, we also touched on uh, the piece by Carlos Simon, a person who is, inhabits many compositional worlds and a brilliant composer who's doing many different projects now, and you probably have been hearing about him. But his work, is it Between Worlds? Um, if you could talk a little bit about that piece, and it, we, we talked this afternoon briefly about how he was inspired by the story of an artist, a self-taught artist named Bill Trailer. You can look at this person's work online. It's astonishing. He left behind a thousand pieces of art when he died at age 96. He was born into slavery and lived until he was a very old man in, in poverty, really. But this is what inspired Carlos. But how does, how do you, and this goes to the question of narrative, you as a storyteller. So, I'm trying not to give away too much in this concert. Uh, so this, uh, that piece, Between Worlds, one kind of came to me, um, kind of fell in my lap in a way. Um, I'm looking at my manager. <laughs> it fell into my lap um, as it was not written for me, but it was written for the, the Klein String competition, which happens every year. Um, and this was kind of like the commission work that the competitors would perform. Uh, I, had, I had no understanding or even realization that this was even written. And then a request came in for me to fly to New York and record this piece, which I hadn't even seen the music for yet. Um, but as I worked through it, through it um, with Carlos in the studio to piece it together, um, I became so fascinated with just this simplicity, I think, in many ways, and the idea of this kind of drone or just a bass that then invites an opening in the same way that the Chinnery Ung piece does in the very beginning, in a very different way. I think it's um, it's more heated up front for Chinnery, he gets, gets right to it, whereas Simon really allows you to, well, invites you in and over time really unveils more and more layers here. And then it becomes more and more complex, but by the end, um, there's a sense of peace, very similar to the Chinnery Ung piece. So I figure that these would be beautiful kind of companions, one that somewhat opens this last set and one that definitely closes it in a very different way. But there is a, a true sense of exhale that is connected to this work in a, in a beautiful way, but also just extremely beautiful writing um, for the instrument, for someone that does not play the cello. I'm always fascinated when I'm working with composers that have no direct connection to the instrument beyond being a great technician of their craft as, as, as creators and composers um, that can write so well. George Walker, the late George Walker, was, was a great example of someone who wrote so well for the instrument, but of course was an absolutely amazing pianist. Yeah. You mentioned the simplicity in, in, in that one, and that reminded me of the uh, Calvary Ostinato piece, which also deeply affecting piece that is super simple apparently, but not so simple to bring off. And uh, it has these incredible kind of blues inflections in the plucked notes. Talk about that piece. So this is Calvary Ostinato. It's part of a larger collection by... Um, Coler's Taylor Perkinson, who was based in Chicago for many, many years, um, started at the Institute for Black Music there, well as well at the Columbia um, College. Um, but this is a part of a larger suite. It's the third movement of what's called Lamentations Black Folk Song Suite. So in many ways, he's he's exploring different types of musical idioms under the kind of the, the guise of uh, polyphony for a monophonic instrument. Um, and in this specific one, you feel a deep connection and a deep kind of referencing of folk and blues uh, genre influences in, inside of this work. Um, I call this his version of the sweets, yeah. 
So, um, and but he goes in a very, very interesting directions with it, but it's quite, quite stunning, but also tricky because in the notation, it's not a very clear, this is in four, this is in three, this is in two. He leaves it quite open, actually. There's no direct meter changes. It's all kind of like long form. And then he leaves it up to you to really figure out where the commas and where the periods are or where the exclamation points are. <laughs> um, so in many ways, so understanding what he's pulling from, I think, really starts to help um, any interpreter understand how to kind of go forth. Yeah. It's his, uh, this piece really, um, it, 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 it shocks you by all these things. It takes a while to figure out what's going on. And I read that it was from a, referenced by a spiritual, and he died on, which I, a spiritual I didn't know, and he died on Calvary. But it also might be symbolically referring to a lynching, which is even more powerful, every, every aspect of it. But I was interested to, to read lots lately about um, this composer because he's having a, a big renaissance, I think, in the last five years, as, as he should. The person he's named for, um, Samuel Coleridge Taylor, we have two, manu two uh, items in our cases tonight that you can see. Um, also a very significant figure, but um, I, I'm just in, interested in this one because he was living like Carlos in a world of jazz as well as classical music, brilliant in all these ways. And I think, didn't he even work with Max Roach for a while? Correct, yeah. 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 So is it, this is just such a rich, rich uh, panoply of music that you're about to experience tonight in, in so many dimensions. Um, I want to ask you about a quote that you made that I, I saw. You've talked about. Uh oh. Uh oh. <laughs> yeah. No, this isn't a gotcha moment. Don't quote me. <laughs> <laughs> about um, trying to change the face of the landscape in which music can be experienced. And that's very much what, what you're about to, to see. Regardless of class or ethnicity or background, moving towards more choices in what to put out there and be a reflection of who we are. This is a dis continued goal, I think, for you. I think so. You know, um, this must have been, well, yeah, 20 years ago, I commissioned my first piece. Um, and I remember my late uh, teacher now, the late uh, Andre Melianoff, who was part of the DeCapo Chamber Players, if any of you ever saw them in New York City. Um, I remember when I told him that I commissioned this piece, I was really proud, I was really nervous also, because I had no, no experience working with living composers, but uh, here I am, you know, 20 years old, I'm like, oh, I'm gonna have someone write something for me. And he's like, well, isn't there already enough out there? Do you think you need to? I was like, well, yes, there is a lot, Andre, but there's nothing that was written for me. <laughs> Uh, but he just smirked because this is also someone who has had so many pieces written for him. So I thought it was funny that he <laughs> was so many, many of which he made everyone in his studio learn also. So, um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Voila. Uh, but um, for, for me, it's, it's been interesting that I really wanted to try to find ways of telling as many possible stories as I could. Um, and the cello just happens to be the tool with which I'm doing that. It's been my ticket to see the world in so many ways and to be able to share so much with the world. Um, so for me, it's been pushing up against, in many ways, older tradi tra traditions that may, may, for some people feel that, you know, I should only be doing old music, but uh, the great Ursula Oppens always said, play everything, play all of it. And <laughs> Well, I won't say what else she said, but <laughs> I'll leave you with that. But you really to play everything and to really try to have as much fun as you can because you're only here once. So I might as well blend as much as I possibly can and, and just experiment and try. Um, there's no harm in that, yeah. Um, I wanted to say that one of the awards that Seth has had is the Chamber of Music America uh, Michael Jaffe Visionary Award, and that's kind of a unique uh, concept. I wanted to ask you what your definition of a visionary is and what's your next step. <laughs> you know, you've, you've been very successful in, in doing exactly what you just said that you wanted to do, um, and then I'd love to know what your next views are. What's coming up for you? Martin, what's my next <laughs> Um, you know, uh, there was a time 
um, when I was trying to plan everything and I was trying to control as much as I possibly could in the career and trying to dream and dream and dream and trying to exercise those things. And eventually I decided, you know, five years is, is a little too much. So let me just cushion it down to like two year goals. And for me at this point now, I find that because I'm being pulled in so many different directions and a project like Difficult Grace, which was one of the biggest creative feats I've ever attempted, that's not just me on stage, but it's me on stage acting and, and orating, but also there's dancers and there's film and then, then conversations with art of Jacob Lawrence and Barbara Earl Thomas and the lighting and the sonography. So all of this is just so many hats. Um, amazing hats, but it's a lot to juggle on stage and to carry those stories. I remember the first few times getting on stage and being just scared to death to actually to do this, because it's, it's different than me, oh, I'm going to go play Kodai, I'm going to go play box suites, I'm going to do Beethoven. It's a different feat because I'm telling one person's story in many ways. In this way, I'm telling so many, but I'm also telling my story at the same time. Some of these pieces were created in tribute to my late grandmother, my gr late grandfather, who were very much so connected to the Great Migration. Um, and they are part of that story in many ways. Um, so for me, if I pull it back to visionary, um, I'm daring to be different. I'm daring to dream. I'm daring to dream the dream that I don't already know to dream yet. Um, and I'm using this tool, which is the cello, to kind of take me there. And getting out of my comfort zone, as my mother continues to remind me every day, to eat my fear. I'll say to eat my fear. Um, so to dare to do the things that I don't know, or the, the things that truly scare me, but maybe those are the things that I need to lean further into, because just maybe they will transform me. And hopefully, you all do. Yeah. <laughs> This the question of vulnerability, it's particularly in these programs where you're doing the multi-voice things, it's just tremendously daunting, I, I'm sure, but you're, yes. you're doing it. <laughs> I've had some practice now. <laughs> um, I was thinking about a, a comment, a Cornell West comment, which I, I can't quote exactly, but it's something very moving that he said about um, African-American creators that they have created modernity because they have been forced to create and recreate themselves. And I see this in the, all the composers that we're hearing tonight, each one of them is, is extremely powerful. And um, I, I wanted to hear too what you thought in terms of um, how, how instruments take us beyond what we do, because we, we had the pleasure of hearing you uh, played the Strad cello and some of the pieces like the Natalie Joachim piece and so on, they, the instrument just soared when you played it. Mm -hmm. And it was fascinating to hear that in the Monty Adkins piece, which has an ambient music track. And so it's very symphonic. So with instruments, do you ever think about taking up any other forms of creation? Not that you don't have enough already. <laughs> Aren't I doing enough? <laughs> Um, I've done a little bit of composition, but I will never call myself a composer. Um, and that way, I'd rather just call myself a creative, um, because I have no true formal training in that way. But I've, in in the way that I have basically learned through those which I have studied and dedicated my life to studying. So understanding their forms and their languages in that way, and helping me kind of find my way little by little in secret. Um, uh, but no, I mean. I think I'm I'm good for now. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's amazing what you're doing. Well, I'd like to have other people um, ask some questions here. We have a somewhat limited time, please, and we'll we'll bring a microphone out to you. It's just a quick question. Um, you were performing on a long bench, you said, and you have other people sitting there, and. Do the people sitting there get to feel the vibrations when you're playing the cello? Is that oh, yeah, indeed, indeed. Yeah. I think probably for many performers that might be daunting because, oh, my God, the public is right next to me. They can hear me or they're going to hear me mess up. Uh, but that was part of the thing of kind of getting out of my comfort zone. If I can invite people in and maybe all, but there were also some that just did not want to sit on the bench. They just felt like it was, you know, it was a betrayal. <laughs> <laughs> but in a, but more and more would come and sit, or they'd sit at the very end of the bench, or they and then they get closer and closer. 
<laughs> and then they then then some that were just truly fearless would just sit right back to back with me. And that was actually quite amazing. But also for me, because then I hear I hear and I feel them breathe with me. And then essentially it becomes entrainment and we're kind of moving in the same cycle. And that's a very different experience. Um, Sign me up. Okay, great. <laughs> Uh, first of all, thanks much. Uh, tell us about any pushback that you've gotten from, you know, any uh, traditional uh, music spheres. Uh, you know, this is classical and it's a cello and you're not supposed to do that with a cello or whatever. And how you deal with that kind of stuff. You just do it. <laughs> Like Nike. Have, um, have you gotten pushback? No, I, early on, I think it, some of that was coming kind of just from studio training and some of the teachers I had. The early, the, the early onsets of that are some chamber coaches. Um, but I, I'm pretty sure there was probably more concrete examples. I probably just blocked them out at this point in my life. And I'm just trying to just create and do as I want to do and tell the stories that I feel like really need to be told at this, po at this moment in time. Um, because I spent you know, years just trying to be that cellist, be that musician that you know, we're seeing everywhere and, and every recording looks like that and everyone is playing the exact same thing. And then I got to a point where it's like, you know, I've been commissioning more and more lately and especially a lot more Contrarity, thank you, Martin. Uh, <laughs> I'm always giving him flowers because he works so hard. Uh, <laughs> that's my manager, everybody. Uh, <laughs> but it's a thing of, um, it became that, the, not that I don't think so many of our kind of workhorse canonical cello Contrarity are amazing, but I was, I've been finding more and more that I really want to find ways to kind of bring to light voices that are here now. And that was something that Andre instilled in me from 17 years old, Ursula a few years later, and then teachers more and more after that. Um, and then getting to work with these, you know, iconoclastic composers that we, we all know and many of their scores are here, just here in this next room, um, that truly encouraged me to kind of really lean into that work and try to champion it and give it as many legs as possible so that as many people could hear them. Not that I'm not also playing the old borrowed music, as I like to call it, um, but I try to find ways for them to kind of live together and find the ones that I really um, resonate most with. So, yeah. Um, so it sounds like you're going to be uh, playing a very special instrument tonight, um, but I don't really Two know Two very, very special instruments, so but one from can Curious. Can expand, uh, or maybe you're going to explain it when you take the stage, but I'm very interested in hearing. Oh, is it? Oh, it's not any longer now. It's, it's been transported. Um, so this is the uh, 1697 Castel Barco Stradivarius. Um, it's an amazing instrument, but I think also from this period in time, the lower bouts are much wider. Later cellos that came from Stradivarius start to become a, quite lean in some ways, but this one is quite amazing just because of its specific sound qualities or its, its profile. Um, and it's been interesting to try to harness, I think, and, and I was rehearsing, I was like, this thing just wants to project, it wants to be really loud, and it wants to be heard. Uh, so like trying to, f fighting to find the subtleties to get it to do the thing where on my cello, it's easier to kind of pull the sound away. This cello just, whoosh, it just soars. It just pushes, it pushes through, uh, which is, it's not a bad thing. That's not a bad thing. Uh, but me, it's still new. I've only, only been with it for a few hours. So maybe, you know, few days would yield something different um, for me. But already it's, it's quite amazing and it has this very, very rich lower bass register, but also the upper part of it, it just sings. It's not uh, punchy or screaming, it just, it's soaring. It almost like you can hear the sound spin in the air. So it's quite amazing, yeah. And with very little effort, I'm not, I don't have to work hard all the time. <laughs> But for the most part, it truly, uh, it just does the thing. It's the, the dream of it, probably every string player. Yeah. 
So we're in 2024. If we were at 2074, what would you want to see as changes, opportunities, differences, and creative innovations that we don't have? Oh my God. <laughs> <sighs> okay, let me think. Um, I think more, well, that's, well, that's so many multi-pronged there. Um, I mean, I think all of this is, is cyclical in, in many ways, but funding for the arts and for the arts and innovation through technology as well, it's here to stay. So I feel like we more of us need to lean into this, but also especially in the educational pipeline, not waiting for students to get to the university to start to embrace this in ways and to show how we can tell stories, how we can express ourselves in those ways, but also educating the general public on understanding how to experience these works. And I think part of the reason there's been this long-held stigma, especially in academia, around contemporary work, um, is, and that has trickled its way into just public life, is that there is an issue around education for new creation, not only in music, but in the arts in general. Um, we have these amazing museums that are free or very little to pay for, and concert halls, and, and so many concerts that are happening, but there still are so many in the public that don't go for fear of not understanding, or I don't get it, or it doesn't sound like this, it's not the music, which I, I understand and I get it, and it's not every music, not every art is for everybody, but I think there is something everyone can find in it, that they can see themselves inside of it. Um, I hope there to be more commissioning, um, especially amongst the orchestras um, and large um, presenting bodies as well, but also the small presenting bodies. You all are doing great here. Um, so I, I can't really say what 74 really truly will be, um, but I think if we can start to plant even more seeds now to support those initiatives, I think it will be a really bright future. <laughs>